This is the Washington, D.C. that everyone knows, the home of our national government. We rarely think of it as a city with the same problems plaguing our other big cities, but it does have them. And one Washington community is attempting to solve these problems in a unique way. We'll find out how today as Discovery visits the Anacostia Neighborhood Museum and finds out there's something new in Anacostia. Discovery 70, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen. Two hundred thousand of our national capital's overall population of nine hundred thousand live here, across the river from the Capitol building and the Lincoln Memorial. The area is called by people who live here, Southeast, and this particular part is Anacostia. The residents here are predominantly black Americans. Before the Civil War, Anacostia was a place where freed or escaped slaves could begin new lives as free men. Today it's overcrowded and badly in need of more schools and increased medical and sanitation facilities. Much of the public housing is run down, deserted, and inadequate. It's estimated that there are three rats for every man, woman, and child. There are no country clubs in this black community. Very often the street corner serves the same social function. Some of these men are unemployed. Quite a few work on very early or late shifts and spend their free time here. Anacostia might look like a lot of other blighted areas in our country living with the hope of improvement amid the hard facts of not much change. But there is a difference here, a significant difference. The Anacostia Neighborhood Museum has had five lives. It was built as a movie theater after World War II, and then over the years it's been a roller rink, a church, a hall for talent contests, and now this unique museum. The people who have built the Anacostia Neighborhood Museum have taken three frame buildings and turned them into a place of unlimited possibilities. museum directors decided at the beginning that no element of the community would be denied entry to the museum's facilities and services, which might even mean just a warm place to talk with their friends. Alvin Prue often comes in to play on the piano, and it would seem to museum regulars an empty day if he were not heard playing his specialties, gospel and jazz. Like other segments of the community, the men on the corner take pride in the museum and its accomplishments and have been responsible for many of the constructive suggestions that the museum has responded to. These little people also contribute their ideas to what they would like the museum to do for them. In fact, their actions were directly responsible for the current major exhibit at the museum. Come by here, my Lord, come by here. Come by here. Not all cultural activities at the museum are quite so informal. This fine Washington choral group is known as the Columbians. Last summer, under the sponsorship of the Anacostia Neighborhood Museum, they conducted a highly successful tour of Western Africa. On several occasions, the Columbians were the first black group ever to perform in the countries they visited. And they even gave some of their concerts in presidential palaces. The idea for the Anacostia Neighborhood Museum came from Dr. S. Dillon Ripley, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. He and men like museum director John Kennard 
and Councilman Stanley Anderson wanted a museum that could best answer the needs of the community's residents. Their philosophy is best expressed by John Kennard in his own words. We decided that this would become a museum of Afro-American history and culture in order to bring about a whole new awareness of who we are, where we came from, where we hope to go. Cultural exchange is a two-way proposition, and the museum also serves as the sponsor of African groups who come to Washington to perform. In addition, locally manufactured African styles are exhibited here. All this is done to allow the people of Anacostia an opportunity to experience firsthand something of a culture which is related to their past. What do you think about having live rats in the exhibit? Live rats? <laughs> live rats. <laughs> <laughs> what if they get out? You know, they are crafty little critters. I mean, you know, them things get out of any predicament. I mean, make Giving this group of young people a chance to become involved in the planning of an exhibit is one reason the Anacostia Neighborhood Museum is different from most. These young people will also be active participants under the supervision of a professional staff in both setting up the exhibit and running the museum. Community meetings, much like this one, have resulted in the current neighborhood-oriented exhibit, The Rat, Man's Invited Affliction. Make it so that, uh, I mean, I know it's some type of material around here that, that rats just don't get out of. One recent exhibit was based on the life of a famous black patriot who lived in Anacostia. Just a steep walk up the hill from the Anacostia Museum is the Frederick Douglass home. It was here that Douglass, one of the outstanding black Americans of the 19th century, lived the final 18 years of his long life. Frederick Douglass was probably the most famous of all American Negroes of the period. He would be recorder of deeds for the District of Columbia. And then, from 1889 until 1891, U.S. minister to Haiti. He'd been born in 1817, the son of a slave named Harriet Bailey, and an unknown white father. He was 21 when he made his second attempt to escape from slavery. This time he made it, and free, took a new name, Douglas, which he borrowed from the hero of Sir Walter Scott's romance, The Lady of the Lake. In the North, he worked as a day laborer, and at night spoke eloquently before anti-slavery societies. During the Civil War, he helped organize two regiments of Massachusetts Negroes and urged other black men to join the Union Army. During the Reconstruction period, which followed the war, he worked for civil rights for his people. The Anacostia Neighborhood Museum has prepared a touring exhibit on this great black hero. Frederick Douglass is part of Anacostia's past. The Norway rat is unfortunately very much a part of its present. How does a museum plan to serve the community's past, its present, and its future? We'll find out in just a minute. One of Anacostia's problems is rats. Rats exist in every city, but there are more of them in these backyards and alleys than there ought to be. Refuse pickup is a problem, and overcrowded conditions inevitably create an environment very welcoming to rats. But one thing which the museum would like to do is to help the people who live here realize that the rat doesn't have to be an accepted condition of life. Rats live wherever people live, because the people make it possible. The people provide the food which the rats need to sustain life. It becomes clear 
that we are the hosts and the rat is the guest. All too often, it thrives because we've made it possible. But it doesn't have to be that way. The people of Anacostia know about rats. They know well enough that you don't send small children out to the garbage can alone at night. They know that you don't reach under the porch steps without first taking a good look. But rats are largely unseen because they're nocturnal animals. They take cover by day and move around freely and comfortably after dark. This backyard could be any one of thousands in Anacostia or in any other city. It looks real, but it isn't. In order to give the people of Anacostia a good, harsh look at the vicious animals who share their food and their lives, the museum has created this backyard, a controlled situation in which the world of the rat is turned inside out. In this environment, bright lights have been thrown on these Norway rats during the night, and subtle, indirect lighting is employed during the daylight hours. These youngsters and grown-ups of Anacostia are seeing the Norway rat, their local rat, in a way most of them have probably never really seen it before. The floor of this backyard isn't really dirt at all, but a kind of plastic composition made to look like the earth of any backyard. The difference is that the rats cannot dig into it and make their own hiding places and burrows. The exhibit's designers have provided two ready-made burrows, both of them leading to glass windows down here. This way, people who come to the museum can see something few people ever see, rats actually nesting. These Norway rats are living upside down lives. Day is night and night is day. And their natural fear and caution has been stripped away from them. Now people can see just exactly what sort of animal the rat is and precisely how it lives. In the Let's see what. What's your name? Oh, let me. What's your name? You're not. Can you tell me what's inside the ant? The rat. Where do you think the rats live? Where do rats live? In the hole. In a hole? Yeah. Right down here. In the what? Do you ever see rats in your apartment? I've seen the rat. Where you live? I've seen the rat. In your house? No. I've seen the rat. Do you ever see rats where you live, Aaron? You did? Yeah. I've seen the rat. Now, now, three. Now there's three. Oh, look at them. Now there's two. 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 There are some terrifying facts on display here. They deal with the diseases the rat carries and with its tremendous ability to reproduce. A female rat can produce a litter of little rats every 25 days. She never has fewer than eight, and she can easily produce 12 or even 18 at a time. One pair of rats can produce between 150 and 200 rats each year. One pair can be responsible through their offspring for 350 million rats in a breeding lifetime of between two and three years. It's not a pretty story. But if it helps to throw some good, strong light on the problem of the Norway rat, then the museum will have performed a service for everyone who sees the exhibit. Did you ever see a rat before, Denise? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. sure. Uh -huh. When did you see a rat? Um, out of the step on my porch. My dog, baby. I need money. Uh -huh. Were you ever bitten by a rat? Uh -huh. Were you ever bitten by a rat? A black boy is slouching on tenement steps. He is haunted by the smell of the garbage allowed to bed in a ghetto. A museum like this one can explain a part of the world to the youngsters and adults who come here. And there's still something else it can do. There's a way of improving the tools of the people themselves by broadening and developing their interests and their abilities. We'll find out how that happens in just a minute. The 
Anacostia Neighborhood Museum is a part of the Smithsonian Institution across the river. But it's here, not there. And it's in large measure a community project. Therefore, it's intended to deal with the problems of this community and this time. But staging exhibits is not the only way the museum serves the community. Is to start a project in photography where youngsters in the neighborhood uh, who aren't versed at all as far as the camera's concerned can indirectly learn photography, which can be a trade, it's a livelihood. But first and foremost, they get a chance to learn about their neighborhood. John uh, Kennard, seen here talking with photographer Michael Fisher, has been the director of the museum since its inception and is primarily responsible for its continued success. As usual, he's exploring new and additional ways to serve and involve the Anacostia community. Though the idea for the museum originated at the Smithsonian, it's totally reliant upon the community for its continued popular support. Recreate and enhance the quality of life there through the arts. It could be sculpting, but the sculpting must be based on some significant feeling about one's community. Like the drawing and the painting, the same thing. Photography, the same thing. So art has meaning for people who haven't originally been, um, shall I say, initiated in an appreciation for art. That art speaks to the needs of the community. So that you're working on your mouth, my mouth, my nose, my eyes. What does all that mean? The Anacostia Neighborhood Museum does not confine its activities to its main display building. Here in the Craft Center, staff members like artist-in-residence Georgia Jessup and potter Rennie Parziali work with local children and adults to develop and inspire artistic skills. Any interested person can call upon the staff on any day to use these available facilities. Some of the items made in the craft center have been placed on sale in the museum store. Gail Pettigrew learned silk screening here two years ago, and already she's putting this skill to use for the benefit of the museum. The Christmas cards that she has designed and is reproducing will be sold as far away as Los Angeles this year. Although time only permits her to produce a limited edition now, perhaps next Christmas, funds acquired from this year's sales will help purchase a silk screening machine that will increase her output. This mobile unit houses small, constantly changing exhibits that are designed to interest those not yet fully aware of the museum's offerings. When it's completely outfitted, it will contain a full speaker system and will be able to show slides and movies on every corner of this large community. In addition to the mobile unit, small shoebox size exhibits will circulate in the schools. These will primarily be condensed versions of the main exhibit. Okay, you guys ready? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna do the butter system. The butter system, remember what the butter system is? Yeah. What is the butter system? You wanna do things together. Right, doing things together. Uh, take a turn. Jim Campbell, a former model maker at the Smithsonian Institution, now spends all of his time serving the museum. In addition to the casting and molding workshops he runs at the center, he also has taken the initiative in bringing his skills to local elementary schools. At the Bernie School, Jim works with youngsters to help them learn an acceptable means of expression with their hands in a way which would otherwise be unavailable to them. I have mine. All right. And we sift it. We don't pour it, we sift it into the water. It pours out, look at it. See, very smooth. Okay. Just like pancake flour, no lumps or anything. This is why it's important to mix it right. Hey, that's beautiful. Hey, that's beautiful. <laughs> okay, now. You get it? Yeah. Okay? To your places. Hey. Let's do it in a big way. Let's do something. All right. Okay? Hey, there's the water. On the table, you have a Okay, put your water.
Jim Campbell's workshop takes the museum to the people. It also helps stimulate interest about activities inside the museum itself. In the something over two years since the birth of this museum, there have been exhibitions of subjects as far ranging as jazz, Negro patriots, the people and the culture of Jamaica, Frederick Douglass, and now the rat, man's invited affliction. There are just 15 staff members here, plus 15 members of the youth corps whose salaries are paid through the neighborhood youth corps. There aren't any guards here saying, don't go there or don't touch that. There isn't any need for guards. This museum belongs to the people of Anacostia. John Kennard said, if we had enough people for guards, we could use them for something better. We'll be back in just a minute. Today, the Anacostia Neighborhood Museum plays an important role in the lives of the people who live here in Southeast Washington. If you'd like to find out more about life in a black community, ask your librarian for any of these books. Black Pride by Janet Harris and Julius Hobson. Cities Are People by S. Carl Hirsch. And The Riot Report, compiled by Barbara Ritchie. Be sure to be with us next week as Discovery continues to discover the world. Bye-bye. The Discovery Production Unit's domestic transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. Jules Power Production, in association with ABC News.